Good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending our webinar tonight that's focusing on lambing and calving management that is presented by Marcy Ward, who is the Extension Specialist from New Mexico State University. Yeah, today we're gonna visit about calving and lambing. We're kind of in the throes of both. Um, so that makes the timing pretty good. And personally, it, you know, it kind of is a sign of spring as well uh, for a lot of people to see the new ba babies on the ground. It's always a good time of year. Um, really, these guys are pretty similar in many ways as far as um, what to expect on the actual stages, um, what to do to prep for uh, the um, lamb or ewes and cattle uh, nutrition, a little bit different. Um, we'll talk to that. Uh, neonate care, pretty similar, but again, you know, um, hopefully there will, you'll pull some differences out of there. And then I am going to touch on when things go wrong. I know that's probably what most people are concerned about. Um, in a PowerPoint, it's really tough to um, fully demonstrate kind of what you can and can't do uh, when things go wrong. Um, but uh, we have a tool now that we've been taking around the state to kind of help on the calving side of things. If you're in a situation where you need to pull a calf, we can do some trainings on that. So uh, a use gestation is 145 days. Uh, typical for most operations is seasonal breeding in the fall with lambing to follow February to late March. Um, health and gestation, health and nutrition should be monitored throughout gestation. Sheep are a little bit different. They tend to be more susceptible uh, to some met um, metabolic disorders the U on the U side. Uh, we'll speak to that a little bit and, and how you can sort of try and avoid it and then what you can do if you should experience it. So their body condition is a score between a one to five, and we always like moderation best. And for optimum lambing season, and then consequently breed back, um, maintaining that body condition at a two and a half to three is ideal. You don't want them too thin or too fat. So the first trimester um, is, zero to 30 days. This is basically during the time that the U will, will recognize she is in fact pregnant, which is helpful. Um, but at the same time, first trimester, whether it be ewes or um, cattle, really any livestock, they're very susceptible to stress. And if they are under stress for whatever reason, whether it be predation or rough handling, whatever it is, they very likely will go ahead and, and absorb those pregnancies. So you get what's called early embryonic loss. Um, and you want to try and avoid that at all possible. Once they're into the second trimester, you're pretty safe that they're going to maintain those pregnancies. But this is where you want to really start to look at nutrition and health. Um, and then in the third trimester, this is where the fetus grows the fastest. And this is where you really need to um, consider increasing the nutrition in your dams. So uh, they're preparing their body and their system, not only for milk production, but for that fetal growth. And in the sheep industry, this is a time, really good time to go ahead and vaccinate your ewes for those clostridials. That's your 7-8 way um, or the C and D per fringes vaccine, either one of those products usually work really well on this part. So basically you want at least a 95% conception rate and with breeds that are able to uh, lamb multiples, 175% lamb crop. Um, and then hopefully you only endure less than a 10% mortality. Um, and then the goal ultimately is longevity of breeding, the breeding livestock. Okay, so I apologize for the dog. I'm gonna have to figure out, I might have to move. Let me, give me five minutes or not even, I'm gonna walk to the other side of the house and keep talking <laughs> so you can't hear them. All right, so uh, divide the management into various stages of production. And again, this is driven a lot by not only stage of gestation, but after she's lambed, her nutrition goes way up just to cover her needs to support milk production. 
Um, and then it's going to also de be dependent on how many multiples she had. So obviously the more she had uh, in terms of twins or even triplets, the more nutrition this she'll have to have to sustain those. So here's kind of the requirements I'm talking about and, and what you're dealing with. That, you know, this would be the first 30 days here. This is your mid gestation, mid to late. You really want to start ramping that up. And then here's the, once she lambs, her nutrition continues to increase, okay? So that's something, if at all possible. I know in range use, if you can supplement at all, this is the time to really help them out in that regard. <clears throat> the idea through supplementation is that you're gonna support, support that fetal growth, but also support mammary development. Um, it can help prevent pregnancy tox, uh, toxemia. However, I will say if you get your use too fat, you can kind of increase the risk. So it's kind of a tricky balance there on these, these use um, for pregnancy toxo, uh, pregnancy toxemia. Um, and then obviously this good nutrition program can help with healthy lambs um, as it promotes colostrum quality too. So in terms of specific feeding just prior to lambing, um, what are we talking about? A one to two pounds of grain per day. Um, again, you wanna hit them with that enterotoxemia or the clostridial vaccine. Um, and then you can, that would be about the time you'd wanna shear those ewes. That's just some extra management there. Okay, so if you have inadequate um, nutrition, if they're too thin, they can also suffer from uh, ketosis or pregnancy toxemia. As a result, too, you're going to have smaller, weaker lambs, um, and then the survivability. Whenever you have a weak lamb, it's really high risk that you're going to lose those lambs. So, so we want to avoid them being too thin on the U side. It will also, like I said, will reduce the quality of that important colostrum. That's the in introduction of immunity to these little guys. Um, and then consequently, it will just also impact overall milk production. If she has multiples, you know, then it's just a domino effect of one weak lamb turning into two and so on. Uh, nutrition is directly tied to wool quality um, and quantity as well. And so if you're got a wool, um, if you're breeding for wool quality, that's something to keep in mind. So the, on the other side of the board, again, it's a tricky balance with sheep particular, cattle not as much, beef cows. Um, this pregnancy toxemia is also prone to overconditioned use um, and um, their metabolism is just a little bit out of whack. They get almost what would, could be called not really insulin resistant because they don't need that much, but, um, but they do get what's called ketotic. And that's when they lamb and then they don't have the energy to get up. Uh, fat users are also more prone to prolapse. Um, large fetuses that ca cause dystocia can also trigger this. And um, again, these oversized uh, lambs have a higher mortality as well. So really um, fat is expensive to put on. It's a tricky balance. So again, that goal is that body condition between two and a half to three in your use for a good lambing uh, experience. All right, let's move into the nuts and bolts of lambing. Um, jugs. Now, not everybody uses them. You know, you're in range conditions. You're not going to use them necessarily. Um, but why do, do some people use these things? Um, the big thing is to reduce predation. Uh, you're, you're keeping them in a confined space, hopefully out of the elements. Uh, so they're not as exposed to weather as well. And ultimately, you're going to improve your lamb crop by utilizing these. And you don't need some fancy um, outfit to do this. You can see in this picture, they just cut up some cattle panels and uh, made a, a pen for the ewe and the lamb. So in terms of how many do you need, you can kind of figure 
Uh, about one jug per seven to 10 ewes total. That said, if, if you have a fairly intensive breeding program uh, where you're gonna be uh, having several lambs hit the ground at the one time, you wanna be sure and have enough space um, to, you know, to compensate all the ewes at that time. Doesn't have to be really big. They're not gonna spend much time in there. Um, but five by five is kind of your ideal. You can go smaller than that. Uh, this one looks like it's a four by five. So no super big science to this whole concept, um, but it is good to, uh, um, in terms of reducing mortality in your, your lambs and improve the observation of how the lambing went. And then once they're nursed, they're dried, they're standing, all is checked as normal, you can kick them right back out. So this to me is as important as kind of knowing what to look for in the stages of um, partrition is being ready for lambing. So you want to have sort of a stock of supplies ready and slightly different on the sheep side is the injectable vitamins with selenium. Uh, sheep tend to be a little more prone to a selenium deficiency, which causes what's called white muscle disease. Can happen in cattle, but you don't see it quite as frequently. Um, and then obviously the ad &E can help boost their immunity as well. So have that ready to go. Um, needles, syringes for that particular reason iodine for the navels. And then a lot of people go ahead and castrate when they're fairly new before they kick them out. Um, and then docking tails fairly new also. So having those supplies ready uh, is helpful. And then identification is absolutely key. So ear tagging should be part of that process. And uh, added plus and bonus and, and probably a requirement to, to know what thing, how things are going as a record book. You know, we need to make notes if someone had trouble, whether the you got sick or you lost lambs for whatever reason and why. Um, that can kind of uh, be a good way to look back when it comes time to deciding on if you're going to keep a you or not. The should haves, um, towels, gloves, meaning um, vinyl, or vinyl, yeah, vinyl gloves and or uh, OB gloves or both. A lubricant and um, heat lamps, hair dryers. Um, for those times that you might run into a little trouble, these are kind of for your emergency kit. Um, and then lamp holders, you can see what that snare looks like, excuse me, being used right here. So post lambing, um, if things for whatever reason should go south and, and she has trouble and the lamb has trouble, a claustrum feeding tube is really key. Keeping claustrum on hand, that's the first milk that's she'll produce for at least three to four days, sometimes longer, but it, really that lamb needs to get that milk in its system within the first 12 to 24 hours. And mom's source is the absolute best. Um, followed by if you've got some frozen from other ewes, um, and then powdered is okay. It's, you know, they get better with those uh, formulations all the time. But if you can somehow transfer from the U straight to the lamb, uh, that's the best option for the first few feedings. Plus, the, the other thing is you, if you keep stripping out the U, um, she is going to continue with milk let down and you won't compromise milk production. So you do need to, if you lose the lambs and you maybe want to graft one on her, keep milking her out. That's kind of a side note um, to kind of keep her in milk. Lamb bo bottles, pop bottles usually work pretty good, but you got to have the nipples small enough, right? So they have those in most of your farm stores. I really encourage people keep those packets of electrolytes in their wheelhouse. Um, and scours, because they can be in confinement at pretty good risk of getting a very contagious bacteria infection that causes diarrhea, uh, coccidiosis. And so that is something you can do to prevent it. There's products you can put in water. And then if you have a case outbreak, you can give a sulfa-based antibiotic, clears those up pretty well. And they're usually in the form of little boluses. 
powdered lamb's milk specific. You can use kind of a multi livestock species brand. That's usually cheaper. Um, but if you're really wanting to get the correct nutrition into your lambs, have it specified for lambs um, to get, you know, the true nutrition that they need. Antibiotics always good to have on hand, not only for the lamb, but for the ewe. Uh, and then a probiotic, something um, like probias, if you're familiar with that, it's a, a paste that you put in the mouth. Um, that's also good to kind of get the gut going uh, and get them maybe on feed a little quicker. For the ewe, if you have a ewe go down, um, and I didn't speak to milk fever is another one. The, these two um, metabolic disorders, the ewe just doesn't get up after she lambs. She doesn't have the energy. She often will either curl her head back or just lay it flat on the ground, pretty um, specific. But basically she doesn't have enough circulating glucose to do anything. And so that requires some intervention. So having an IV kit uh, with either propylene glycol or calcium gluconate on hand um, is probably a good idea. You can have a prolapse spoon. Hopefully you don't deal with this very much, but the, this is a unique tool to sheep to kind of keep the uterus in place if it has been expelled during a tough lambing. Um, and then iodine also, or uterine boluses um, that you would, if she has any kind of trouble at lambing, you certainly want to try and dry the uterus up and avoid uh, uterine infections but having those antibiotics as well is pretty helpful. Okay, so stages of lambing, you know, it could be up to three weeks prior um, that she'll, that this is the dry, part that drives me nuts, right? Um, you'll look at them and you think she's gonna go anytime. She's bagged up, she's loosened her back in, she's dropped and you wait and you wait and you wait. So there's no specific timing of this early stage of getting close to lambing, um, but, but the gut will drop and head towards the back um, of the pelvis. That's basically the lamb or lambs getting into position. Um, and then typically, not always, Typically, she will truly bag up about 24 to 48 hours prior to lambing. And that's the point you kind of want to move them into um, jugs or just really start watching them closely. So stage one should last about one to eight hours. It just depends. Um, younger, you know, those first lambing ewes, uh, ewe lambs, they're not knowing what's going on, might take them a little longer to figure it out. Um, but one to eight hours is kind of... The, the normal range. She's going to be nervous. She's going to pace. She's going to act what I would call colicky, right? Because she is in pain. Um, and then at the end of this stage, she will expel the water sac. At the beginning of stage two, should only take about one to two hours max, particularly in your, your aged ewes that have had multiple bursts. Um, that should go fairly quickly, 15 to max 30 minutes per lamb. The water sac ruptures and the ewe will get a little more serious about laying down to push. Um, and then at some point you should start to see feet appear. So this is where I really start my watch clock of concern for whether it be um, sheep or cattle, because once that water sac breaks uh, the the uh the newborn's pretty vulnerable right because now you got to get them out and breathing and so hopefully this goes fairly quickly this part um and the first thing you want to notice is feet position in this case it's it's proper um i maybe should turn my camera on but basically they the feet will be faced together and down they might be crossed a little bit because it's crowded in there but that will tell you you're dealing with front feet if the, the hooves are facing down. <clears throat> Next, the head will appear, and this is where you can get hung up at the shoulders, pretty common in sheep. So this is where you'd kind of want to pay attention if she's really stuck at this point. I also, you know, if you have an opportunity, if you're around when the birth is happening, if per se she's in jugs and she'll let you, 
Um, you can go ahead and pull those fetal membranes away from the uh, lamb's mouth so it can at least have an opportunity to try and start breathing. At the end of stage two is basically the birth and she will stand up and um, that's on purpose because she wants to complete the birth. It will also kind of shock that lamb into breathing a little bit by hitting the ground. Um, and then obviously the, the licking part in stage three is part of all of that as well. Um, if you happen to be there, you want to make sure it's not, nothing is blocking its airways. It's not struggling to breathe, that kind of thing. Um, and the best thing you can do, honestly, if all has gone well, for, uh, is just leave them alone. Let mom do her thing. Let that maternal instinct kick in. Um, if you are pretty confident she's going to have more than one, um, pay attention and monitor, but you don't necessarily have to just sit there and watch and watch and watch, even though it is kind of fun to watch and be born. Um, but uh, sometimes a really bothered uh, you might abandon something or not um, bond, bond, bleh, I can't talk to them, bond with its offspring quite as quickly as you'd like if, if you're there bothering it, okay? And also keep in mind when there is multiples, the second and third lamb are always weaker than the first. And so be prepared to maybe help those guys out um, to make sure that they are strong enough to kind of hang in there. Stage three is an important part of milk letdown as well. If she's had a difficult birth, this doesn't sometimes happen as naturally as you'd like. Um, and so in that case, you might want to give her some oxytocin. The other thing that you need to be kind of mindful for is that she's expelled the placenta uh, within 30 minutes because retained placenta is meaning they, they, for whatever reason, they stayed attached. They're still inside of the uterus that that can, that tissue gets infected pretty easy. And so um, you can really see an animal go downhill quite quickly with what's called a retained placenta. Okay. So when to provide assistance, um, if an animal is in stage one for longer than eight hours, she's still acting nervous. She's still, you know, showing all the signs, but is not expelling that water sack. The worst thing that happens to me, the nightmare for this stage is when they've, ex the water sack has ruptured inside. So you can't tell that it's already ruptured. And in that scenario, um, again, observation is key, but the end result is usually not the greatest um, if it's missed after eight hours. If in stage two, uh, any of the following occurs, okay, the mother gets to a point and she's pushing and pushing and no progress is being made um, after 30 minutes, then it might be time to intervene. If um, the water sack is observed for longer than an hour and the animal's not trying to push, she might not have the chemical reactions needed, the hormonal response needed to go ahead and let labor continue. And so that's where you might need to intervene. And eventually, you know, with that kind of pressure um, on the cervix, that might go ahead and get her in gear. Um, but that could be an issue. If the animal is showing signs of severe distress or fatigue, again, a thin you or an older you can get tired rather quickly. And so um, this is problematic because then it causes problems for the lamb. And oftentimes you'll see these lambs that have had a difficult birth with very swollen tongues that can actually uh, inhibit their airway. Um, it can visually be determined. Also, say after the water sack has ruptured and things have gone kind of normal to that point, but you see that the feet are upside down, that's a sign it's coming breach. Um, or like I said, no progress. Um, and you're not seeing feet at all, or you're seeing just one foot. Um, this is something that would be worth investigating for sure. 
And then finally, after lambing again, that retained placentas can be quite nasty. It can be fatal to the ewe. Um, so, so that needs to be paid attention to as well. So when you provide assistance, and again, you know, doing this via PowerPoint, and if you've never been through this, it's, it's sort of hard to explain or, or show what you're dealing with in some cases than these nice, pretty drawings. But basically, I would highly encourage you bring someone to the party that is experienced, preferably a veterinarian. Um, because at this point, timing is kind of of the essence. And so you know you have some trouble going on and you need to be able to fix it quickly in the U. You. you can't just pull and pull and hope it comes out. It needs to be corrected into its normal position um, before you can really pull it out. And so having an experienced person there is really recommended. Um, but at the same time, it's a good way for you to get experience in dealing with difficult births. Hopefully it's not common, um, but it it's, it's happens, right? Okay. So to get ready, the first thing you want to do is glove up if possible. Personally, to me, sometimes the OB gloves are more in the way than helpful, but if you can at least put vinyl gloves on to offer some sort of protection to that animal, that's good. Um, have plenty of lubricant around because once the, the, the fetus is in the right place, you wanna be able to slip it out fairly quickly and it's a very helpful tool. So then you just dive on in. Again, um, you wanna assess what you're feeling. And sometimes it can be tricky, like this one here with twins, you see two front legs, they're in the right position, but they're two totally different animals. Um, and with sheep, we're dealing with a very, very small workspace. Um, and so it makes it that much more difficult to correct um, difficult bursts or dystocias as it's called um, in sheep. But the best thing to do in many cases, if it's not in the right position, is you are going to have to push it back in, manipulate it, and then bring it out in a normal position as best as possible. And that can take an excruciating long time. Uh, that's where experience matters in those kind of situations. Now, if you're in a situation where you feel like he's in a correct position, position, meaning, and I don't, I forgot to put a correct one up here, but both front feet are out, the nose is in the birth canal, but you're just stuck for whatever reason, whether it be just the sheer size of the cat or the lamb, or they tend to block a lot on the shoulder. Um, that is something that can be fixed by walking the, grabbing hold of the legs and just walking them out. Um, or a hip lock is another common area of obstruction. And that's where you just kind of turn the, the, the lamb on its side and roll it out. Sounds easier than it can be at times, but that's kind of the gist. Um, but again, you want to fix whatever issue, particularly in these really bad, these situations probably be calling a vet because these are very difficult to fix. The breach is, can be probably the most common of these three. Um, this can be done, but you have to be very quick about it because he is in the uh, ambionic fluid at this point. And it, the, the most common cause of death in this situation is they drown, okay? So post slamming observation, again, is very important. Uh, you need to, did the U stand? Okay, so give her chomp time. Yes, she's probably physically tired, but there's a difference between tired and dealing with a metabolic disorder that prevents her from standing. Did she prolapse? Meaning, are you seeing any uterine tissue outside the body that does not look like it should be there? Um, has she cleaned, expelled her after birth? Um, and then you acceptance. Now, first, or you lambs tend to struggle with this. They're nervous. They went through something very painful. It was very stressful. And they see the cause being that little white thing running around them. Um, and so rejection is kind of hot, can be kind of high in those 
young ewes. This is where uh, keeping good records is important because you want to identify those that aren't the greatest with their maternal instincts. It's fairly heritable and it's going to be a problem moving forward and there's a high chance of rejection and then you're dealing with trying to find another uh, you to put her on having a bottle feed and so this is kind of pretty important factor to look for in a trait in a you did she lick it off is it dried has it gotten up it need that these babies need to get up in about 30 to 60 minutes it's really critical that they get there and, and particularly in colder months that they get the warm milk in their system so if there's if the answer is no to these then intervention appropriate interventions needed. So this is a pretty clinical sign of a you going through some sort of metabolic disorder. Um, she's not standing up. Um, and so this is where you would want to get your either propylene glycol or your calcium gluconate in her as quick as possible. And what's amazing about these two drugs is they work very quickly. So it will only take her once it starts fully getting into her system, just a few minutes to stand and feel better. Okay, neonate care. Make sure it's nursed, make sure he's dry. Um, a lot of times they'll be born very yellow. That's my comium sometimes. And it's, it's an indication of stress during the birthing process. Um, not necessarily a big deal, but something to maybe keep an eye on. Um, and then spray the navel. You wanna give maybe a quarter to a half mil, depending on the size of the lamb of that vitamin E selenium shot. You can record its birth weight. Um, and then really important to make notes of how the birth went as well. If things go south and you have a weak lamb, difficult birth, if you have a difficult birth, regardless if the lamb is healthy or not, if it was a challenge to get out, you need to intervene by tubing it with colostrum. Or if the U ultimately dies or gets sick, uh, again, just go straight to the colostrum, milk the U out, strip it, put it in um, whatever you use for tubing. Um, this is pretty common for lambs. It's a smaller way to do it. It's a smaller tube and it's a, it's a 60 cc, looks like, um, syringe. And you want to do gravity flow. So just a tip. One of the things, and I'll show it on the cattle side, but it's the same for sheep. You can drown neonates by drenching them, okay? So one of the tricks you can do is the esophagus is, travels down the left side of the animal into where the rumen um, is. So if you start on the right corner of its mouth and aim it to the left and down, you should bypass the trachea and not put the fluid in the lungs, which that's that's sheer, you know, that's kind of a death sentence for those poor little guys. So a lot of people are nervous about doing this, but the benefits um, are far outweigh the risks. And again, if you go from the right corner of the mouth to the left side of the cheek and in down the throat, uh, you're almost a guarantee that you're going to hit there. Now, if you go through and you hit some of your health, um, animal health, websites, they have now some almost foolproof gadgets that make tubing both sheep and cattle a lot easier, less chance of mistake with stoppers and markers and stuff like that. Um, you can give them a slight dose of a probiotic after a day or so. Um, this will get the gut going. Um, in terms of how much to feed, about 100 mils every two to three hours the first 14 days, which means you're not going to get a lot of sleep, but you can be realistic about it to see how you're getting along with um, 100 mils, then bump it to 150 and continue to increase but decrease frequency until you get to a, a twice a day feeding. And the rule of thumb to know that you're getting adequate amount of replacer in them is about 200 mils of 
product per two pounds of body weight a day, okay? So the toxemias I talked about and the milk fever, again, this is kind of a pretty typical position of a, an animal that's down after she's lambed. Um, you want to do uh, for toxemia, she's what's called ketotic, meaning she's very low in her blood sugar and high in her ketones. And so you do want to offer propylene glycol um, IV and uh, again, um, this is something a veterinarian can do for you. Um, but the jugular runs right down the eye line. Um, and if you can find the jugular and have an IV kit, just let it do a drip until she, you can also drench them with uh, propylene glycol. A lot of people prefer to do that. And it's a little slower to take effect, but it, it can be helpful. Milk fever is a little different and again, kind of it's unique to dairy cows and sheep. Sheep have a big dump of milk um, when they're carrying multiples in particular and that into their mammary gland. And that big demand of milk kind of throws their calcium metabolism off and it causes the same symptoms of being down. They don't have the energy um, or the fuel to stand back up. And so again, a calcium gluconate, so you're still getting cal or glucose in their system. You're going to give them a boost of calcium. Uh, this is preferred to be given IV or sub Q. Um, but again, both of these products will elicit a pretty quick response in those views. Okay. So that was it in a nutshell. You're going to hear kind of a lot of repetition. I'm, I didn't really know how to make this work without doing that, but if we want any specific questions on sheep right now, be happy to do it, um, or we can move on to cattle. Marcy, this is Marge. Yeah. Um, what are the normal uh, weight uh, or the pounds on newborn lambs? As far as what they should be born at or? At, well, at the time at the birth. Yeah. Um, you know, I would think about it, if it's a single, they should be weighing right at that seven to eight pound mark. If they're twins, you're going to cut that by a third. Um, it just kind of depends on if they're singles or multiples. I'm not sure if I'm answering that correctly, but because um, I'm not as familiar with that particular breed, but. Thank is you, milk Marcy. sure i don't think i really sorry that i didn't probably answer that as best anyway so is milk fever mastitis uh, no um milk fever is a metabolic um disorder that happens as a result of lambing meaning as soon as that mechanism for her to let her milk down happens it overwhelms her system to ask for calcium in the body. What mastitis happens typically will happen um, after uh, the lambs are born. Infection could happen prior to, you know, when she's bagged up, but it's basically an infection of the, um, the teat. And so if it's not taken care of and they have mastitis um, drugs you can do where you inject the antibiotic right up into the milk canal um, to kind of reduce that. And then you just need to make sure that the U or the lamb is using the others. And I'm sure the U is not going to let her use the infected teat. Um, very problematic since they only have two spigots. Um, so something to watch for um, is in the signs of mastitis is the bag gets very warm and swollen and clearly painful to the U. Um, but the one teeth that gets infected will swell. Um, but then again, you can lose a whole half in that case of the mammary gland due to infection. So it's important to get early intervention if you think you suspect mastitis. Good question. Another question, uh, Marcy, mm -hmm. on the lambs, um, 
uh, I know the male lamb, you have to uh, castrate, and then we tend to dog the tails as closest to the body, to the back. Um, is it kind of cruel to do both of them at the same time? Or is you it know, too much stress? When I think about that, and if you hit them at the same time, all at once, then it's over, right? Versus they're in pain from one procedure, you come back a week later, maybe two days later and, and hit them again with a painful procedure, then it kind of prolongs that. Um, where if you, if you just make it into one deal, right? Castrate and dock at the same time, it is painful. There's no denying that. Um, there are some things you can do uh, if you, you're concerned on the pain. Um, there's a drug you, you can ask your veterinarian. Um, I, we use it at the bull test for bulls that are lame. It's not as um, hard on their body as, say, banamine or some of these other drugs that we use for pain and inflammation, but it's called meloxicam and uh, it's tablets and um, that can help kind of mitigate pain. But really, in my opinion, the quicker you, if you're proficient at doing both docking and castrating and you can do it very quickly, it's almost a shock factor that, that they don't really feel it at first and that the pain might kick in a little later, but it's at one time versus spread out. And is this uh, medication uh, over the counter or it has to be prescribed by the vet? It, it'll need to be prescribed, yeah. So, um, and uh, just a side note, coming down the pike, if you've not attended a beef quality assurance lately, um, unfortunately, or fortunately, it depends on how you look at it, but unfortunately, your LA 200s, your penicillin, some of the things we, we really like to use as over-counter antibiotics will no longer be available. Uh, you'll have to get a prescription for those as well. So this is where pre preparation is really important. Uh, build that relationship with your veterinarian just for two reasons. One, you have trouble with, and it's trouble happens. It's the livestock industry. It just happens. We unfortunately have death loss. We have problems during calving and lambing and having that connection is really important. But on the other side too, is when you're preparing to get ready for lambing or calving to have these drugs in your cabinet ready to go, you're prepared for worst case scenario. So that's just something to think about. So the question on chat is after doing treatment, when can the lamb suck? Well, um, knowing mom, she's probably not gonna let, hopefully it's just a single when you're dealing with mastitis. Otherwise, um, they're both gonna probably be only allowed to utilize the one teat, the uninfected teat, because she'll probably kick them off the infected teat simply because of pain. Um, when the pain starts to go away, the drug has obviously done its job, and then it's probably safe for the, the lambs to go ahead and start using that quarter um, or that half, I guess. But uh, mom will take care of that. When she feels better, then she'll let them suck, but it's, it's not something that she could probably force to happen. So good questions. Any others before we move into cows? And the, the cow part might go a lot quicker simply because they are very similar. I've tried not to repeat this process too much, but there are slight differences that hopefully you pull the differences out. So we'll go ahead and move on. But again, if something pops up in your head and you wanna talk about it, um, oops. There we go. All right. Where did my, oh, hold on. There. Okay. From current slide. Okay. So we're going to talk about nutrition really quick on the requirements of the cow. My slides got out of order. I apologize. Um, basically, um, 
this is where we are right now, just right before calving. And you can see the nutrition, both in energy and protein is starting to ramp up. And, um, okay. If you have any questions, feel free to enter them in the chat. Yes. Okay. All right. So, uh, so that's something to consider in this time of year, our grass is dormant and uh, they're likely under supplementation for that reason as well. But um, it's really important that last 60 to 90 days that, that you really pay attention to the body condition of your cows. Okay, and then that trajectory continues after she calves. So just like the U, it, the, the nutrition, plain of nutrition continues to increase until she's peaked out at her lactation at about day 60 after calving. Okay. All right. So for gestation of the cow, it's 283 days. Um, this is a graphic that kind of shows what's going on based on time of, of gestation. And this is um, the first 16 days is when she kind of goes through that recognition factor that yes, I am pregnant. And the first things to grow are the organs. And then you hit that last 60 days, you have maximum growth, you've got muscle, you've got bone, you've got hair. All of these things um, require a lot of energy and protein and minerals um, and vitamins to successfully grow that calf, okay? And then you also need additional nutrition that she can store for use after she calves and can use for milking. So this is just another graphic kind of showing the same thing. Again, in towards the end, the last three months, you've got a lot of muscle growth. You've got a lot of fat development, which also makes a lot of for energy needs. Um, and so that's where the nutrition is really important. In terms of the cow, how you can view this on the outside, since you can't really see how the fetus is growing on the inside is body condition, just like the you, this is the best tool we have to visually appraise the status of that animal. And for cows, it's a scale of one to nine. And so the ideal um, is five. Again, moderation is best. Uh, you can have too fat, which is expensive, plus problematic come calving, um, or they can be too thin, also problematic in terms of colostrum production, and then consequently milk production after she calves. So the thin cows too have higher requirements because they're ultimately trying to reach maintenance. And so um, in order to do that, they're gonna have to gain weight and that's where the higher requirements come in. So when you're out in the pasture, you're checking mineral, you know, chopping water, whatever it is that you do to keep an eye on your cows, um, feed supplement, you want to make mental notes and you can keep it simple. You don't have to do a scale of one to nine, but you can certainly do one to three with one being thin, two being average and three being excessively fat. You can adjust your nutrition accordingly. And for me, if I see a lot of threes, just a couple months out of calving when my first calves are scheduled to hit, that's when I really get a little nervous and I want to ramp up my nutrition um, because it's, if you remember that graph, her nutritional requirements continue to go up 60 days after she calves. So if she's thin and her nutritional requirements are saying, I need more, then she'll even lose even more weight and it's, then she won't breathe back. So if you're starting to see a lot of these, that's kind of a red flag to ramp up your nutrition. Checklist for the cow side or the calving side, fairly similar again, needles, syringes, iodine spray, ear tags, uh, record book. Now, um, some calves, well, most calves in New Mexico don't get tagged until um, branding say, but if you do put your hands on the calves at birth, good idea for one, um, but have those supplies at the ready for that. 
if you happen to catch a calf being born and you're going to put his hands on, you know, you're going to put your hands on, go ahead and uh, spray that navel with iodine. The reason we do the navel sprays is that's just a straw effectively for bacteria and you can get a navel disease and then that can be deadly if not caught in time because they can go septic, meaning their whole system becomes infected. The blood does. And so drying out that navel um, or the umbilical cord quickly uh, will help kind of prevent some of those navel infections. Should haves, again, worst case scenario, but always good to be prepared. Towels, gloves, lube, heat lamps, hair dryer, and in this case, calf chains or calf straps. Um, slightly different apparatuses uh, to pull calves um, at times. And then uh, really worst case scenario, if you need a lot of leverage, calf pullers, um, rope halter, and being able to uh, restrain the cow sometimes is needed. And so being prepared to do that is also important. Okay, just like with the, the, the sheep, you want kind of, you want to bank your colostrum, right? Every chance you get, bank your colostrum. So if it's out of the cow that the calf you've had to pull or whatever, go ahead and take as much of that as you can from her. You can freeze it. Um, you can put it in like ice trays, put it in the freezer. It will, the proteins will stay intact. And though when you'll need it again for another calf, um, you can simply do a water bath to slowly warm it to a temperature so you can tube it that way. Um, but fresh is always best. And then it isn't a bad idea to keep powdered on hand. So just to have it. Calf bottles, nipples, electrolytes, again, are important. I usually put those in with my milk replacer um, when I'm feeding a calf just to kind of give that the little extra boost that they need and maybe reduce that chance of scours. Um, and then uh, the scour prevention, not real common in New Mexico in these big pastures, but if you're in confinement, this would be a good preventative is again to use that CORID uh, just to sort of prevent that coccidiosis if you're calving in a dry lot. Powdered calf milk, calf milk replacer, again, is better than the kind of generic all purpose um, because it is designed for cattle. Sheep and cattle do have slightly different nutrient requirements um, and levels of tolerance of certain vitamins and minerals. Antibiotics, probiotics. For the cow, again, not as common um, in your average beef cow, uh, but it's not a bad idea to keep that same bank of either propylene glycol or calcium glutinate. Propylene glycol, again, is for that pregnancy toxemia, and calcium glutinate is for milk fever. Um, in your pantry, I mean, you, you can store it. It's got a long shelf life, and it's, it's good to have on hand. Prolapse needle and twine, iodine, uterine boluses. If there's problems with pulling a calf, that should just be an automatic go-to as part of your procedure. And then antibiotics. Okay, so couldn't find a lot of <laughs> beef cow because most of them are well past this stage before they're caught in the middle of calving. Um, so you're gonna see a lot of dairy cows calving on this deal. Uh, but th what they typically do is you'll see her off by herself. She'll have her tail cranked out like this cow is. Um, and this again will last one to eight hours. Uh, she'll hold the tail away from the body and just be nervous and then get off by herself. Eventually she'll get serious. She might even lay down to push that water sack out. But in most cases, you know, you can see she's just sort of grazing and pushing it out. No big deal. Um, and that's the end of stage one. Stage two, she gets a lot more serious. She's more up, she's more down. And at this point, you should see this calf in this picture. Um, the, the sack hasn't quite ruptured yet, but he's almost completely out and his feet are in the correct position. You can see the nose, all is good and happy. We like that when we see that. Um, and eventually, um, 
again, this is where you want to check the feet position to make sure that's going well. And it should last on the outside two hours. Cow, a lot of cows will lay down and have them in 30 minutes. Heifers tend to take one to two hours on the outside just because they don't know what they're doing. Um, and then the stage will end hopefully with a successful calf expulsion. Stage three, again, isolation is best. Let them do their thing. Um, heifers, however, you know, at times if they're out in the pasture and they're clearly not interested in what just happened in the back end, it, you, you can fix it. You can bring them in, put them in a small pen together. Just be sure that she doesn't get so aggressive with this thing that she tries to kill it then that would be something to go in your record book as this is probably a heifer I don't want to keep because um, maternal instincts are highly, highly heritable. Uh, this is when milk letdown should happen. Now, if there's any type of calving problems, um, they, uh, they will sometimes not let down their milk on their own. And that's where this drug oxytocin might be a benefit. Um, and then just like with the, the use, you really want to see that placenta drop pretty quickly. Okay. So I'm going to stop real quick and talk about the body condition of this cow. She is marginally thin. Okay. So if you think about now she's got to support this calf milk production and breed back, you know, in this case, she's got a big old hay bale. She's probably going to be able to do it fairly successfully. But if she was out in open pasture where the rains haven't hit yet, she is really going to struggle and she will likely lose even more condition trying to support um, growing that calf. So be mindful. This is sort of a good picture of if you can avoid it, try to ride at cabin. Just like with the the you, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, Barge here. Mm -hmm. um, in the previous slide, you mentioned that um, one of the cow would kill its own calf. Yeah. Um, that that's that's strange to me. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, it's, I didn't know I, that happens. I've I've she never because we were pretty attentive and but her behavior was really aggressive. I've run a couple, couple times I've had heifers just like put their heads right into them, roll them, stomp on them. And um, what you can't, and she's still really stressed from the event. So what we've done, so it's not a total loss. We pull the calf, we tube it with colostrum, we dry it off, um, let her calm down and then reintroduce that calf and watch carefully. And then eventually she may go ahead and take it. But a lot of times it takes getting her in a chute, getting that calf to nurse right off of her um, uh -huh. it, and get that pressure off of her bag that that can sometimes help as well. Um, uh -huh. But but I've seen cow, calf re rejection and it's horrible, but it, it wow. has happened, yeah. Wow, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so again, this is pretty similar as the use. I'm not going to begrudge it a whole lot, but again, when to intervene, it, if at all possible, and I'm probably as bad at this as everybody else, you're anxious to see that all goes well. You want to see the babies hit the ground okay. You want to, you know, and you want to see that baby stand and you want to help him stand and you want to intervene because you think it's the right thing to do. Um, but oftentimes, unless it's very obvious that there is an issue, whether it be feet position or she's running out of steam to finish the job, oftentimes those thin cows just run out of gas. It's not a big, difficult thing to intervene. You just help her by pulling that calf out. Um, and that, that's fairly easy situation to fix. Um, but other than that, you know, you really want to give that cow a chance. That said, you don't want to lose the calf. If you determined, particularly say in a heifer situation, that that calf just isn't going to come out because it's too big. Um, a C-section is probably needed. That decision needs to be made um, fairly quickly. Um, if you can see a foot that's the size of your fist, 
there's a very good chance she's not going to have that calf naturally. <laughs> um, I shouldn't laugh because it's not fun. But um, the other thing is, is it's just sort of a gut feeling to know rather than just pull the trigger too soon, because the consequences of pulling the trigger too soon, and she probably would have had that calf normal, is rejection, particularly on the heifer side, um, uterine infections, milk letdown, um, reproduction, you're going to delay her breeding back pretty well documented at least a month. You know, normally you want to bred back about 60 days after calving, um, where this will take maybe 90 if she's had a tough, if she, if you had to pull that calf. Um, and so there's a lot more complications to intervening sometimes if it was inappropriate than benefit. Okay, so now that I gave my little spiel on, on let mother nature do its thing, there are times that that's not possible. Um, so glove up again, I find the AOB gloves, even though they're more sterile and sanitary and ideal, they're also a lot more cumbersome for me to get a hold of that calf um, and try and keep the the sleeves up and it's just, it's not handy. So I, I will put on vinyl gloves sometimes. Um, I can get a fairly decent grip with those, but the idea is first assess the problem. Then if it's, if it's just stuck here where the pelvis is at the head or if it's a shoulder thing or if it's a hip lock, I mean, these things are, are not easy to fix, but they are fixable. These positions are a lot more challenging. Um, the head back, uh, head down, this one's not too bad. One leg back, not too bad. Um, but some of these are just very challenging to fix. And so you can stick your arm in and she's well dilated. You've got a lot more room than you would in a U. So you should be able to kind of at least assess the situation to determine if, okay, we need to load her in a trailer and take her to town. We need a vet to come out or maybe we can help her out. But just like with the U, you want to fix the calf before pulling the calf, right? Okay. And also I can't stress enough have someone with you um, if at all possible. And I, so I'll use myself as an example and it's not a good one. I had a cow with a calf doing this and he was alive. He was still bumping on me and we were getting along okay. And it took me forever to reach down and grab this leg and pull it out. And by the time I got everything ready to go, I ran out of gas. And I couldn't make it quick enough to pull him out in a timely enough fashion to get him out alive. And that broke my heart because I just, it's, it was very laborious. It's hard to do. Um, and um, he, he would have lived, I think, if I had had someone out there helping me. Okay. So just have someone with you. They can give you a break or they can assist you. Um, and they can, and two will make it go quicker than by yourself. So like with the, the lambing and, and fixing it, um, it does take practice and hopefully you don't get practice because <laughs> the idea is you breed your cows in such a way that you don't have to pull calves. Um, but um, that's where vets get practice. They're well-versed. They know how to get in there, get out of there, um, flip the calf in the right position in a very quick way or pro provide a C-section. Um, realizing vets aren't amply available at timely when you need them most sometimes. That's where learning these techniques in case of emergency is important. And we're very fortunate for those of you who know Steve Lucero, there he is actually doing something for a living. So we've got this simulator, if you haven't seen it, um, where this calf weighs about 65, 70 pounds. And we can put him in all crazy positions. You can learn how to reach in and put the straps or the chains on the calf. You can put the snare on the calf and actually pull this calf out. And it, it has very similar 
feel to pulling an actual calf. So um, we're very fortunate to have this piece of equipment. And um, one of these days when we can do an in-person workshop, we can maybe bring these models for everybody to practice. So I can't stress enough, observation is really important. If you are fortunate enough to be around when those calves are born, um, you can see, make sure the calf is, or the calf stands in adequate time. Again, you want him up in 30 to 60 minutes. Um, did the cow stand, right? Now those real thin and old cows will just lay there. And that's problematic for the calf. It's not that she's suffering necessarily from a metabolic disorder, but she's just tired. And then the calf can't nurse very easily. And so we want to pay attention to that. Look for uterine prolapse because that's fixable. Um, but it's also tends to happen over and over again. So if she prolapses once, I would mark her as someone to call in the fall. Did she clean? You will see a very sick animal about two to three days if she has not. Again, that acceptance isn't a huge problem, um, but it can be an issue where you probably might need to confine those two together and let that bond happen. And, and then moving forward, she might be fine, right? She might, it might not be one that needs to go on the truck in the fall, but you do want to pay attention. So just like with the, the lambs, you know, getting that colostrum into these ruminant animals is so key that first 24 hours, because after that, they can't absorb the proteins that are so vital for their immune system. Um, and so absolutely key to get them um, the colostrum within the first 24 hours. Anytime you have a difficult birth, even if it was just a tired cow and the, the you know, you just had to pull a little bit to get the calf out, give the calf colostrum, milk her out and, and put it in a bag and put it in an app. There's several different tools out there. Now, this is one that's got a rather long hose. You can get the ones that have that kind of hard plastic bottle with the stiff tube with the, the soft bulbous end. Um, so there's a variety of, of want tools you can use uh, to do that. And then gradually transition off of colostrum into milk replacer. Um, colostrum is really pretty high in protein, high in fat. So even after that 24 hours, it's not a bad idea if you want a little extra energy in that calf to blend your milk replacer with colostrum for a few days. So this picture on the right shows you kind of that tricky part of surpat. You don't want the tube to go down here because then that goes in the lungs. So by putting it in the corner of the mouth of the right side and direct it to the left side and make sure it goes past this juncture right here um, long enough to go into the stomach. Okay, that's sort of the key. So how much to feed? Um, rule of thumb, 10 to 12% of their body weight. So if you've got a 60 pound calf, you know, you want um, like, a, let me think, 600 mils, something like that um, to a, a liter and keep ramping it up. Um, and you wanna start with multiple feedings um, and then eventually get to that twice a day uh, with the liter bottles um, and position of the, bottle is very important for both calves and lambs. Uh, they have to engage what's called this esophageal shunt that will direct the milk right back to the uh, abomasum because um, they really don't, they don't have a functioning rumen quite yet. And the position of the head is on purpose. If you, if you think, why is the cow's udder so low and the calf has to drop down, that's by nature. Um, it's by design that the calf will engage um, when it drinks, it goes right to the abomasum. Okay, so your, your goal again is these bottles hold about a thousand milliliters or a liter and you wanna shoot for that twice a day, two to three times. So again, with this pregnancy toxemia and milk fever, more common in dairy cows, high milking cows, um, tend, or in thin cows, um, or 
can have these issues. And this is just giving an IV to a cow of either, I don't know if it's the propylene or the calcium glutinate, but it's, you know, they're already down. They should be fairly easy to restrain. You can see he just snubbed her head to her hawk and then he found the jugular vein um, with this IV um, package. Not comfortable doing that. Again, I would call your vet. So in summary, lamin and calving management, very pretty similar in terms of stages, what to do, when to intervene, um, and that nutrition can play an absolute key role both prior to and after lambing and calving. But being observant is really important for success. Um, catching problems early, whether it be even before calving and lambing or directly after, not necessary, and you know, just as much as during. Be prepared, can't stress that enough. Having the tools on hand that you need when you need them because you never know when you're going to need them. <laughs> That's kind of the motto to think about. And then do avoid intervening too soon. I know you get anxious. I got anxious. Um, and you want to help, right? That's your, your instinct is to help. And so, but be mindful that it can increase rejection and health issues and reproductive in the future. So before you try and do this yourself, um, shadow someone, ask for help, work with someone to get some sort of experience in pulling animals, lambs and calves, okay? And it doesn't take much. It takes maybe one or two experiences and you get the gist of it, right? But to actually feel the kind of pressure you need to apply in order to be successful in getting the calf or lamb out, is important how to get the restraints on is important and but it does take a little practice but again hopefully through breeding and nutrition you don't have to do that very often try to have help at all times um you know if you know you're going to need to intervene grab you know grab somebody to try and help you through that process if not comfortable at all then really try and get a bet out. They are very experienced at fixing these things in a very efficient and timely manner because time can be of the essence depending on where you're at in that stage of, of lambing or calving. Post-birth care is as vital as pre and during. Um, and again, you just want to be observant, right? That the, the calf or lamb is not too weak for whatever reason. And if so, you want to get on top of that pretty quickly. Um, again, if you see the cow kicking the calf away on one side, it could be an issue of mastitis. Um, if the cow's not getting up, if the calf's not dried off, the lambs are, you know, not um, looking like they've nursed. These kind of things are all really important in terms of observation. So I love this meme every year when the first calf drops or lamb, very exciting best time of year. And then it's also very harrowing and long nights at times. And particularly in, in intense situations where you're doing heifer watches, um, it makes for a long season when you're having to check heifers overnight, every night for two to three months. So, but you can't not love this time of year. This is my absolute favorite driving down the road, seeing all the babies because um, the end result is, is really amazing. So with that, I don't know where we are on time. Um, I'll stop share, can answer any more questions. Sorry for the dog, he just, um, I got as far away from him as I could, but I know you can probably still hear him, I apologize. Don't worry. It's okay. I have dogs like that too. So they're normally outside and they're away from me. <laughs> so I completely understand. I have dogs as well. But um, thank you so much for that great presentation. So we'll go ahead and just open up this time. If you guys have some last minute questions, feel free to unmute yourself or better yet, you can go ahead and enter your question in the chat box. Marcy, uh, Marge again, um, is it 
um, very normal that um, the sheep and the cow eat their ass of earth. So, yeah. Um, here, let me turn up my speaker a little bit. Yes. In fact, it, you know, it's pretty common practice for these guys to do that. A um, couple reasons. They have, they like getting the kind of that extra boost of energy and protein out of the placenta, but it's also sort of a protective thing from predators. They don't want to leave any sort of odor that would draw predators in. So it's almost a protective thing uh, that's been built into their system. I know it's disgusting to watch it, but um, it doesn't harm them in any way. Um, but if, if you're in a confinement situation, you may wanna go ahead and just pick those things up just for management purposes and, and that. Because one of the things that placentas can do is spread disease, right? So if for whatever reason you had an abortion storm um, and these fetal materials are out on the ground, they're getting on the grass and then the cows come and eat off of there, they can get the same disease. Um, predators, coyotes, whatever might drag the, the placenta across the pasture spreading that disease around. And so, um, so if you're in a confinement situation, I would maybe try and pick them up. Any other questions? Okay, sorry about that. Any more questions? Okay, well, I guess that will conclude our webinar tonight. So thank you, Marcy, for taking time out of your schedule to do this great presentation for us. I know it's very informative. Thank you everyone for great questions that you had and thank you all of you for participating in this webinar tonight. So um, that will go ahead and lead me to my next slide. Let's right here, we do have our next presentation, which is going to be on April 7th, um, covering grazing management webinar. This will be presented by Casey Speckman, who's the rangeland specialist from New Mexico State University. So we also have this on our website. Um, if you want to go ahead and head over to our website. We do have it there. I just now enter that in the chat box. So if you, um, our flyers up there, we are gonna be releasing our newsletter pretty soon as well. So that will include information on the next um, webinar that we have, which is grazing management. But um, thank you everyone. There was a question in chat. Oh, sure. Sorry, I didn't okay. see that. Yeah, My bad, uh... sorry Loretta. Let's see. Oh, okay, send a link for the next session. Oh, there was one about supplement. What oh, type of supplement sorry. do you recommend for cows? Okay. Um, so the answers depends. <laughs> uh, I really like, if you think you're behind in your body condition, um, for if it's just lack of forage or whatever, I look for high fat supplements. They're a little more expensive, but you don't need to feed them all the time. Um, you'd want to find something that's like a 6% fat protein levels can vary. Um, it just depends on your preference because typically you can feed more of a 20% or less of say a 30% protein and cost comes out pretty similar in many cases. But if you're in a situation that you need to put on some weight on your cows, a higher fat supplement is what I like. If not, if they came in and they're in good shape and they're maintaining their body weight, then keep your costs down by going with a lower protein, lower fat supplement just to get you through. Um, if you're doing cubes, you know, you're looking at about three to four pounds uh, a day or maybe 10 pounds every three days, something like that. Um, if you're using a, a tub, you just want to watch consumption. That's my only concern on those, those liquid feeds and those tubs that sometimes they overconsume 
or on the flip side, they underconsume, and then you have trouble maintaining that body condition. So if I were to have a choice, maybe not the cheapest option, but hand feeding works pretty good in terms of controlling consumption and nutrition. Um, alfalfa itself can be a fairly economical way to get protein to your cows as well. Um, can be, just depends on the year. Um, but uh, if, it's, if it's locally grown in your area um, and you can get it at a reasonable price, it can be more cost effective than say cubes. So, good question. Okay, well, thank you, Sean, for that question. Sorry, I overlooked it, my mistake. But um, if you guys have any last minute questions, go ahead, feel free. The Navajo Sustainable Agriculture Project is a New Mexico cooperative extension and um, service initiative that is delivered in collaboration with two of our project partners. Uh, one of them is the Nay College Land Grant Office and we also have COPE, which stands for Community Outreach and Patient Empowerment. Um, the project here, um, NSA project, is funded by USDA Outreach and Assistance for Socially Disadvantaged Farmers and Ranchers and Veteran Farmers and Ranchers Program. So to get into our goals and objectives as our project, we're here to improve the operations and profitability and sustainability of socially disadvantaged Navajo farmers and ranchers and veterans farmers and ranchers. Uh, we aim to increase our producers' knowledge in the use of USDA programs. Um, the type of USDA programs that we have here is NRCS, which stands for Natural Resource Conservation Services, FSA, Farm Service Agency, RD, Rural Development, and RMA, which is risk management agency programs and services and those other resource providers. Uh, we also aim to increase the local production and consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables and healthy food for by Navajo families and individuals. 